On this railway adventure, Scotland's Loch Ness Monster, the castle of Shakespeare's Macbeth, and the Stone of Scone on the Scott Rail and Strathsbury Railways. Hi, I'm Bernie Coppell. Just up the tracks, the elusive Nessie, a famed Scotch distillery, and the Rodeo Drive of Scotland. Join me from Edinburgh to the Kyle of La Couch on railway adventures across Europe. Journey across the globe from Scotland to China with world's greatest train ride videos. Experience the breathtaking thrill and adventure of authentic train travel as you follow the tracks to unique history, fascinating people, and breathtaking scenery. All aboard! We're about to embark on a railway adventure with the allure of mystery, the promise of beauty, and the romance of a culture steeped in centuries of glory, royalty, lore, and wonder. We'll begin our railway adventure in Edinburgh and travel through 263 miles of Scotland's most scenic terrain to the Kyle of Locouch. The spectacular sights, sounds, and places include Cawdor Castle, where Shakespeare's Macbeth slew Duncan, the lavish shops of Princess Street, known as the Rodeo Drive of Scotland, a massed band of bagpipers, the home of the famous Black Watch Royal Highland Regiment, Highland Games, the Dewar's Whiskey Distillery, and the bottomless lake, or loch, of the world's most notorious monster. Stay with us for Scottish Highland Adventures on Scott Rail and the Strathsbury Railway. All aboard for bagpipes, trains, and Highland Games. Our railway adventure begins in Edinburgh, 350 miles north of London. From Edinburgh, we'll head north to Inverness, then west to Kyle of Locouch. A railway adventure through the glorious Scottish countryside is just one of the outstanding scenic routes on the ScotRail network for visitors to enjoy. ScotRail considers the Central Highlands and Kyle rail lines to be the most scenic railways in Britain. And as a passenger, you can enjoy an effortless voyage through this historic and beautiful land. Our adventure begins in Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. Before boarding the train, let's take a moment to explore Edinburgh and visit ancient castles that were the focus of so much Scottish history. From the turret, you can look out across the entire city and countryside. And for those with money to spend, there's no better place than Princes Street, known as one of the finest shopping areas in Scotland. Stores are filled with the treasures of Scotland and reflect the proud heritage of quality craftsmanship. The Grand Railway Hotel, built in the Victorian age, will bring you back to the heyday of railroad travel in Scotland, a time when trains offered the only real alternative to horse and carriage. Waverley Station bustles below, with trains on their way to join the main lines of the Scottish Highlands. Just minutes from the station, passengers heading north will enjoy a thrilling experience. The Fourth Bridge, built at the turn of the century, rides high above the water and offers spectacular views. The mile and a half long bridge gives every passenger a front row seat to view the beautiful terrain. Then, on to Perth. The journey from Edinburgh to Perth will take 90 minutes. Perth is known as the Fair City and is built on the banks of the River Tay. The city is famous for its fantastic salmon fishing and beautiful settings. You can stroll along a graceful bridge built over 200 years ago and gaze at this historic city lining the riverside. Perth is home to the famous Black Watch. The Royal Highland Regiment is a reminder of this country's more turbulent times and was created to keep peace in 18th century Scotland. The famous uniform of the Black Watch is worn with pride today. A majestic peacock in all its glory struts on the grounds of Scone Palace. This was the abbey where Scottish kings were crowned over the legendary Stone of Scone until Edward I stole it in 1296 and took it to Westminster Abbey. Protestant reformers in the 16th century burned the palace to the ground, but it was rebuilt some 200 years later. The palace is home to a fine collection of ivories, porcelain, clocks, and needlework. 
you can enjoy these treasures while surrounded by the peacocks who call this historic site home. Our next stop is the Caithness Glass Factory. Visitors are able to see craftsmen create the fine glass products firsthand. The entire process can be viewed from a special glass walled gallery. And in just a few minutes, you'll learn to appreciate the delicate work of making glasswork by hand. From the molding of red hot glass to the final kiln process, everything you see being made is also available for purchase right here at the factory. Our railway adventure now brings us to the Dewar's Whiskey Distillery. Scotch whiskey is one of Scotland's premier exports. This blending and bottling plant can fill over 350,000 bottles a day and ships over 90% of its product abroad. With just a brief moment to enjoy the history of Perth, it's time to move on, but there's no need to stand in line to wait for tickets. Scotrail has introduced the open station system, which means you can now buy tickets right on the train. Our railway adventure leads us to Pitlockery. As the train draws near the station, there are decisions to be made. See the sights or sample the traditional Scottish knitwear and tweeds? But a street banner solves the problem for us. The Scott Rails Vale of Atoll Band draws visitors to the sights and sounds of the annual Highland Games. Cycle racing is a popular event and was added to the games in 1900. You can see heavyweights struggle for glory in the traditional tug of war. The pole takes strong hands and a powerful back, but it's determination and sheer manpower that wins in the end. That was brute force, while this is sheer grace and precision, the sword dance. Footwork and muscle power win the prize for tossing the caber, but this day nobody won. The caber just fell over backwards and never overturned. You see how high a true Scotsman can throw a 56 pound weight over the bar. Finally, the parade of the masked pipe bands. The Highland Games, a day of sports and spectacle for the adventurer. For the fishermen, salmon is the attraction. A special salmon ladder has been constructed on the River Tumul to help these fantastic fish bypass the hydroelectric station. This spectacular scene is called the Queen's View over the Loch Tumul. Queen Victoria made it famous when she stopped here in 1866. Our train adventure takes us on to the next leg of the journey, Blair Athol. Every express train from the south is met at the station by a minibus that will take passengers to Blair Castle. It's home to the only man in Britain who's allowed to have his own private army, the Duke of Athol. This special privilege was granted to the family by Queen Victoria. Set in extensive parklands, Blair Castle dates back to 1296 and offers a traditional welcome to all visitors. A portrait of the present Duke hangs in the paneled entrance hall along with his collection of swords and crossbows. Today, the 10th Duke of Athol still possesses enough medieval weapons to equip a small army, a reminder of days gone by and Blair Castle's turbulent history. In the dining room, visitors can see a silver table piece that was given to the 7th Duke as a wedding present from his tenant farmers. 
The drawing room's finely modeled ceiling and cornice look over a wealth of 18th century furniture and family portraits. The walls are hung with crimson damask and the chimney piece is white marble. These are just a few samples of the treasures that can be found in the 32 rooms of Blair Castle. From Blair Castle, our train sets out along Glengarry. Before long, passengers begin to experience the 18-mile climb to Drumuktur Summit. Here, the hills soar above 3,000 feet, but the powerful diesel locomotive makes easy going of the steep inclines and rise to the top. At just over 1,000 feet above sea level, we roll into Dalwini, Scotland. Dalwini is just a tiny community, but the mountain water is pure, clear, and cold, so they built a whiskey distillery. On guided tours, visitors learn that whiskey has been made here since the last World War, and you can see each stage of the whiskey making process. Master craftsmen mix barley and water in huge copper stills to make some of Scotland's special spirits. One secret of the product that has made Scotland so famous is the quality of the water and peat. But here the true secret is years of storage in old sherry casks. And it's ready to sample at the end of the tour. Our railway adventure now takes us into the Cairngorms, a range of mountains with four of the five highest peaks in Britain. This mountain range is home to the Highlands' vast sports center at Evermore. Now it's time for a change of pace and passengers will move from the diesel to steam trains for a trip to the Boat of Garden on the Strathspray Railway. Once the carriages are coupled for the journey, get ready for five miles of nostalgia each way. On the Strathspray Railway, there's never a chance of being stranded by a railroad strike. Drivers, firemen and the entire staff are all volunteers. It's just like it used to be, steam, smoke and the soothing clank of the rails. All a part of our railway adventure. The Strathspray delivers passengers to our next adventure, a ski lift to 3,600 feet. The lift brings visitors to just 500 feet from the summit of Cairngorm. From there, you can see the entire countryside, look down to the winter ski slopes, and enjoy the cool mountain breeze. Waters gather on the slopes and feed the many lochs, or high mountain lakes, below. Loch Morlick is the heart of the Glenmore National Forest Park and is fed by the mountain waters. The lake sits at over a thousand feet above sea level and a careful eye can see reindeer among the Scots pines and silver birch near the shore. This beautiful place is regarded as one of the most scenic inland lochs of Scotland. You can enjoy the sandy beaches and facilities for fishing, sailing or take a restful canoe ride along the shoreline. From Loch Morlick, it's back to the train station to complete our adventure north. The train crosses the Culloden Viaduct on its journey north. It's one-third of a mile long and built over 29 arches. The bridge spans the River Nairn and leads us to the capital of the Highlands, Inverness. The city of Inverness is home to another wonderful example of railway building construction, the Station Hotel. Guests checking in will shortly be greeted by a magnificent staircase that sweeps visitors up to the first floor. This elegant hotel brings back romantic memories of elegant times gone by. Inverness is located on the River Ness and is guarded on the east bank by the Inverness Castle, rebuilt in 1834 on the exact site of the original, which dated back to the 11th century. On the west bank, the Inverness Cathedral stands watch over the river. It was built in the 19th century. Inverness lies at one end of the Caledonian Canal, which was built by Thomas Telford in the 19th century. Cutting right across Scotland through Great Glen, four locks were built into the waterway to give the great sailing ships of the 19th century a safe and swift journey from the Irish Sea to the North Sea. Today, the 60-mile canal is home to pleasure boats. Visitors can tour Scotland's most famous high mountain lake, Loch Ness, by motor launch. The boats travel along the entire length of the loch. 
throughout the summer, there are daily ScotRail excursion trains from Kingusi, Avamore, and Inverness that meet with the Loch Ness crews. It's a whole day of adventure and time to wonder about the tales of the deep and the Loch Ness Monster. We continue our railway adventure on ScotRail. On our way back to Inverness, we pass the ruins of Urquhart Castle and we once again are reminded of this land's violent past. Built in the 14th century, this was one of Scotland's largest castles and commanded an impressive view of the Loch. Beautiful beds of flowers and lush green lawns give welcome to visitors of the Cawdor Castle. Just a short ride from Inverness, Cawdor Castle brings us back to the time of Shakespeare. It was here that Macbeth murdered Duncan. Today, the massive walls of this wonderful castle create a warm and comfortable home for the Lord and Lady Cawdor. Visitors tour the original kitchens of Cawdor Castle and see the brass and copper cookware. In the gift shop, you'll find many reminders of those days gone by. From the Inverness station, we depart for Kyle of Lacoche. Observation cars are added to some trains with tour guides to point out the sites of interest. These luxurious trains offer armchair seats and a buffet meal. It costs a little more, but it is first-class service at its finest. Once out of the Inverness station, we travel across the River Ness on a spectacular arched bridge. We'll pass along the shores of Bewley Firth and can see the Black Isle in the distance. On both sides of the railway, the views change with every moment and provide an endless stream of images. The Kyle Line runs west from Dingwall through thick forests, majestic mountains, and lonely lochs. Poems are written about the scenes you will enjoy from the comfort of this elegant train. Your adventure on the Kyle will pass one poetic village after another. Achenault, Achnasheen, Achnashelik are all part of the trip. Victorian railroad builders used wagon loads of explosives to blast through the rock on their way. It was the dedication and iron will of these men that's provided us with a smooth, effortless ride we enjoy today. Every bend in the track reveals a new, spectacular sight. The train now travels into Plockton, set on a high peninsula in the Loch Cairn. Out of every window, there's a picture-perfect scene, like the row of cottages set against the hills of Applecross. Palm trees grow, sheltered from the highland weather. And for those who love to sail, there's no finer haven. In the distance, the mountain peaks on the Isle of Skies signal our adventure across the Scottish countryside is coming to an end. But not before we see another engineering milestone for the Victorian age. The Portnacloish Cooting, an 80-foot deep trench cut in solid rock. From there, the track heads along the coast into the Kyle of Lacoche and the main ferry stage of our adventure. So far, we've traveled 263 railway miles on our adventure from Edinburgh. You can sample some of the local cuisine and enjoy the wonderful view, the Isle of Skye Ferry preparing to dock just down the coast. It only takes a moment and a few hundred yards to cross the bay, leaving barely enough time to take in the beautiful surroundings. The sky is rich in myth and legend, and the towering Quillen Hills lay in testament to the tall tales of local farmers. The majestic Black Hills also create a six-mile arc to encircle this tiny island. Whitewashed houses and beautiful cottages dot the foothills and add local color to the landscape of the Isle of Skye. 
Our island visit is the last stop before our journey home to Edinburgh. A railway adventure through Scotland's central highlands has something for everyone. We found mystery, history, romance, and beauty all along the tracks from Edinburgh to the Kyle of Locouch. We hope you've enjoyed bagpipes, trains, and highland games. I'm Bernie Coppell. Join me for the next Railway Adventures Across Europe. On this railway adventure, a seaside resort in Wales with a weather guarantee and the smallest house in Great Britain. Compliments of British Rail and other lines. Hi, I'm Bernie Coppell. Just up the tracks, Mount Snowdon, indoor body surfing, and Lord Abercornwy's Italian Gardens. Join us from Chester to Snowdon on railway adventures across Europe. About 2,000 years ago, Britain became a province of the Roman Empire. Our railway adventure takes us past an ancient reminder of Rome's occupation of Wales. We'll also visit a trendy seaside resort, ride up the highest mountain in Wales, and travel into a land with railways too small for leprechauns. Our departure is from a Victorian station in Chester, England. Our ultimate destination is Mount Snowdon in Wales. We'll discover historical treasures, botanical beauty, man-made marvels, and a miniature world. We'll see magnificent castles and a cathedral built on 14th century pillars, visit Bode Nant Gardens, and ascend the great limestone dome. All this by British Rail, the Great Orme Tramway, Snowdon Mountain Railway, and a little side trip on the Conwy Valley Steam Line. All aboard for Shore to Summit. Our railway adventure takes us to the beautiful country of Wales, a small country in the United Kingdom about the size of Massachusetts, located west of England. Before reaching Wales, the trip begins in the ancient English town of Chester, about 175 miles northwest of London, easily accessible by rail. From Chester, we travel west into Wales and the port city of Conwy. From there at south to Bettesicoed and the beautiful Snowdonia National Park. This railway adventure promises magnificent castles, Victorian resorts, unparalleled beaches, gardens, and spectacular scenery. We begin with one of the popular bus tours of Chester, a city on the border between England and Wales that dates back almost 2,000 years. Chester has a long and colorful history. It was founded by the Romans and is still enclosed by ancient Roman walls originally built to protect the city. The Romans named the city Diva after the river Dee. The bridge crossing here is called the Old Dee Bridge, but it's not nearly as old as the ancient walls. Chester maintains its medieval feel by preserving its architecture. Even modern shops and offices known as the Rose are concealed behind antique-looking fronts. The city's combination of old and modern is a delight to its visitors. Our brief bus tour of Chester ends at the town's cathedral, dating back to Norman times. The cathedral was restored in the 19th century, but the square central tower still stands on 14th century pillars, and the north sanctuary dates from about 1140. From the courtyard to the sanctuary, the cathedral is much the same as it was hundreds of years ago. Calm, relaxing, and beautiful. The ancient city walls of Chester run almost unbroken around the old center. These red sandstone walls date to Roman times, but have been rebuilt.
The best of the Roman ruins are found next to the walls, including the restored amphitheater. The Romans made Britain a province of their empire shortly after the crucifixion. Nearby, there's a Roman temple that has been partially restored. A castle can be seen over the walls of the city. It's been the headquarters of the Cheshire Regiment since Victorian times. Part of the castle is now a museum that tells the regiment's history. Uniforms, saddles, swords, and medals are all on display. Summer is the perfect time to tour Chester. The streets are just as entertaining as the history. Artists and performers hold the attention of tourists and locals. Before Rome's 20th Legion came to conquer Chester, they found that the River Dee was sacred to the native Celts. It's easy to understand why. Centuries later, the river is still a major attraction. To begin our railway adventure into Wales, we depart the English town of Chester from this Victorian station. Our first stop along the North Wales coast is in Rill. This popular seaside resort comes with a weather guarantee. Even if the sun isn't shining outside, visitors can still have fun inside the sun center. A monorail glides slowly over the complex, looking down on the wave pool and water slides. Leaving Rill, the train crosses the river Cloyd, cloaked in early morning mist. The line runs along the Welsh coast to the major railroad interchange at Clondudno Junction. Just a few miles north of the main line is the Victorian resort of Clondudno. The town's two bays, Conwy and Orms, have beautiful beaches. Add the pier and promenade and you've got one of North Wales' top resorts. This is the station for the Great Orm Tramway. The Great Orm is a massive dome of limestone. The unique tramway takes visitors to the top. It was constructed in 1902 and climbs the steep, narrow streets at a maximum speed of five miles an hour, with the weight of the descending car helping pull the opposite car up the hill. Private roads and cable cars also lead to the top of the Orm. From 650 feet up, the view of the town and the bay is magnificent.
The train takes us back to Clendudno Junction. But before taking the main line south, we'll take a side trip over the narrow estuary to Conwy. Here, the skyline is dominated by the massive castle. Passing trains heading for the North Wales coast add to the atmosphere of this majestic town. Historic Conway's main street is a masterpiece of medieval architecture. The castle is considered one of Europe's great fortresses. Edward I built it as his headquarters in his efforts to control the Welsh. Originally, the exterior of the castle was whitewashed. Like Chester, the town of Conwy is still totally enclosed in ancient walls, but in some spots, more modern buildings are encroaching. From a castle built in the 13th century to this Elizabethan house, the Welsh town of Conwy is a tribute to ancient architecture. This house is called Plasmar. It's protected by the National Trust and is open to visitors. Down by the harbor sits a house with a claim to fame. It's the smallest house in Britain. A woman dressed in a traditional Welsh costume invites visitors for a brief tour. Conway is a fishing port. Fishermen still tend their nets on the quayside. But today there are almost as many pleasure and tour boats as there are commercial boats. Tourists can choose a slow cruise upriver or a day of fishing. Beyond Conway, the scenery becomes increasingly spectacular. The wild lands of Sitchnet Pass are just a few miles away. And further along the coast, the beaches of Conway Bay are vast and empty. Resuming our railway adventure, we head south down the Conwy Valley to Tallycaffin. This small country station is the jumping off point for Bodnet Gardens, said to be the most spectacular in Wales. The gardens were developed in the early part of the century by Lord Aberconway. They started off as a series of Italian-style terraces, but soon grew into a series of landscapes covering over 80 acres. The Laburnum Arch is a centerpiece of the garden. In late May, it's covered with golden blooms. The Pin Mill building comes from Worcester and was rebuilt here in 1938. At the base of the garden is the dell formed by the valley of the river Hyrethlin. 
These gardens are cared for and preserved by Britain's National Trust. Traveling through the Conwy Valley, it's on to Clandrust. Here the Conwy River forms a natural barrier. Typical Welsh communities sit at the base of old-fashioned bridges. Shops and cafes cater to visitors passing through the valley. But a circular stone monument is a legacy left from the first inhabitants of the area. And on the other bank of the river, an ancient church breaks the skyline. Following the Conwy River, the train is headed for Betasy Coed, our next stop. The largest town in the Conwy Valley is Betasy Coed. Adjacent to the British Rail Station is the Conwy Valley Railway Museum. The museum's main attraction is its steam-powered miniature railway. The line features a real steam locomotive, one-fifth the size of a regular train. The museum also has a shop and dining car where visitors relax and watch the trains go by. The visitor center at Betasy Coed is a good place to begin a tour of the area. Mountains and forests surround the town, and the rapids of Conwy Falls are just off the main street. This is an area that caters to hikers, but there are also cafes, restaurants, shops, and a craft center in town. For the more adventurous, there are guided tours into the mountains. A network of hiking trails spread all over the valley. Betasy Coed is in the Snowdonia National Park. It's dominated by Mount Snowdon. At 3,600 feet, it's the highest mountain in England and Wales. Visitors come to enjoy the dramatic scenery or to participate in outdoor sports and activities. Climbing to the top of Snowdon isn't all that difficult especially if you take the Snowdon Mountain Railway. The Cog or Rack Railway opened in 1896 and is the only one of its kind in Britain. Thousands of people climb to the summit every year. This 838 square mile expanse of mountains, valleys, lakes, and foaming waterfalls is a hiker's paradise. And from the top, the views span in all directions. Our railway adventure ends here, at the top of Mount Snowdon. The trip from Chester to Snowdon has taken us from sea level to Wales' highest summit, and yet we've only sampled the spectacular railway adventures of Wales. We hope you've enjoyed Shore to Summit. I'm Bernie Coppell. Join me on the next 
Railway Adventures Across Europe. On this railway adventure, a castle of a Welsh king and a journey into the earth as we travel Wales by the Blyneye Festiniog Railway and British Rail. Hi, I'm Bernie Capel. Just up the tracks, slate mines and the home of a man who changed the world. Join me from Porth Madog to Festiniog on Railway Adventures Across Europe. We're about to travel into the heart of Wales. Although it's a small country, its people have had a great impact on the world. Throughout history, they've battled to maintain their spirit of independence. It should be no surprise that a Welshman founded the League of Nations for the sake of freedom and peace worldwide. Our adventure begins on the coast in Porth Madog. From there, by two railways, we'll travel to Blyneye Festiniog and the Slate Mines. During our travels, we'll see castles of both Llewellyn the Great and Edward I, and an Italian-inspired Welsh village. We'll also tour slate mines by battery-powered train and visit the boyhood home of a man who changed the world. All this and the scenic splendor of Wales by British Rail and the Festiniog Railway. All aboard for Heart of Freedom. Our railway adventure begins in the tiny country of Wales. It's an ancient land of proud and fiercely independent people and beautiful rugged landscapes. The native language is not English, as we will see from the names of villages on our Welsh adventure. The Welsh language and heritage are actually Celtic. And the best way to learn the history, language and landscape of Wales is to travel the historic Blyneye Festiniog Railway from Harlech to Blyneye Festiniog. The history of the Festiniog Railway begins in the early 19th century. Then the small country of Wales was no more than a beautiful and remote mountain area whose people managed to live by farming. In 1789, the same year the French Revolution began, William Alexander Maddox arrived in Wales. He accomplished almost as great a revolution in this rugged land. Maddox's adventures, mostly reclaiming land from the sea, almost left him bankrupt. One project involved building a great bank of land, known as the Cobb, to block off the River Glasland. But Maddox soon began thinking of slate. He then turned inland to the present-day city of Blyneye Festiniog. He built a port for shipping slate produced in Festiniog. And in 1828, Maddox began building the forerunner of today's Festiniog Railway. Reminders of this railway can still be seen today. The loaded slate trains traveled to the port driven by gravity alone. The empty cars were returned by horses. The railroad was built by hand. The workers used simple hand tools, horses, and black powder to carve the route out of the hardy Welsh mountains. In spite of the lack of tools, the railway opened officially on April 20th, 1836. As the railway began to make money and business increased, steam instead of gravity was used to drive the engines. The company even decided to take passengers. However, the gauge on this railway was too narrow for steam locomotives in the 1840s. So it wasn't until October of 1863 that the Festiniog Steam Railway was open for business. The declining demand for slate forced the railway to close on August 1st, 1946, after more than 100 years of service. However, a new railway era began in the 1950s. In Britain, people who wanted to preserve the picturesque railways began a major restoration movement. It took 31 years of hard work and dedication to rebuild the Festiniog Railroads. 
On May 23, 1982, the first restored passenger train entered the Blyney Festiniog station. Our railway adventure on the Festiniog Railway in Wales will begin along the coast at Harlech, where the rugged Welsh mountains run down to the sea at Cardigan Bay. Harlech has been immortalized in songs and stories. Here, the courageous men of Harlech resisted the invading English soldiers, who tried to subdue the Welsh in 1468. The city's impressive castle was built by Edward I in the 1200s on the site of a Celtic fortress. Edward hoped to use this and other castles in Wales to overcome the fierce Welsh resistance to an English takeover. Later in its life, Harlech Castle would be the last castle in Great Britain to be subdued by Oliver Cromwell's men in the English Protestant rebellion against Catholic Charles I in the 1600s. Across the Tremadog Bay from Harlech stand the ruins of another magnificent castle. On our next stop, Krikia. This castle was established around 1230 in the time of Llewellyn the Great, the last Welsh king. Sacked and burned in 1404, the castle was never restored. Krikiath is a typical Welsh seaside resort. It offers fine hotels, as well as rail and road links that make it the best place from which to tour the Fleen Peninsula. Two miles northeast of Krikiath is the small village of Flanestumdui, here is where Britain's World War I Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, spent much of his early life. Lloyd George lived in this tiny house with his mother and uncle. In 1916, he was elected the 36th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Today, he is remembered for establishing the League of Nations at the end of World War I in 1919. At the end of his distinguished career, Lloyd George returned to this charming village and spent many hours sitting in this tranquil spot which now marks the site of his grave, overlooking the beautiful river Dwyfor. East of Krakiev is the major town of the area, Porth Madog. Here, the rail journey to the small slate mining city of Blyna Festiniog begins. The beautiful city of Porth Madog was a shipping town. The proud sailing vessels of the 1800s that carried slate across the seas had been replaced by pleasure yachts of all sizes. Across the harbor, the Festiniog Railway has its station at Harbor Station. Every year in the spring, the Festiniog Railway holds a festival weekend. At that time, all the steam engines are brought out on parade. This is Rishra, being prepared for the festival. This engine is probably the smallest industrial engine ever exported from Britain. It was sold to India, but returned to Wales and restored in 1971. On another siding is Shalona, a rare vertical boiler engine. This weekend, Shalona is giving rides to visitors. Inside the buildings are many displays and models, including this incredible O-gauge model steam railway. During this weekend, photo sessions are set up especially for the visitors, and the engine workshops are open to the public. 
the engineers demonstrate new modern equipment as well as old. Back outside of the Festiniog Railway's harbour station in Wales, the steam locomotive Mountaineer prepares the train for the festival. Mountaineer will take us to the town of Festiniog. This engine was built by an American engine company in Patterson, New Jersey. Originally built for the War Department, Mountaineer was used in France during World War I. Set in 70 acres of subtropical woodland, in a narrow valley, Fort Merion offers ever-changing scenes of architectural and natural beauty. The incredible village was built by Sir Clough Williams Ellis between 1925 and 1972. He intended to develop this beautiful site without spoiling it. No doubt about it, he succeeded. There is a first-class hotel on the ground, and many of the cottages can be rented for vacations and weekends. Back at Meanforth Station, the festivities are in full swing. An antique player piano provides background music while railway staff parade in period costumes. One of the most popular attractions this weekend is the chance to be the engineer of a steam locomotive. Britomart was built in Leeds, England in 1899. Unlike the oil-burning Festiniog engines, Britomart still burns coal. All ages can enjoy a ride on this railway. Here is a scale model of a Darjeeling. Now it's back on board the train for the climb to the next station, Penflin. The train needs a double engine because of the steep climb through the rugged Welsh mountains. After a short stop at Penfli, the train heads for Tenabuk. Once outside of Penfli, the line runs mostly through the beautiful forest. Branches from the trees threaten to scrape the sides of the trains at times. Just out of Tenabuk, seven and a half miles from Fort Mato, the train encounters a steep gradient. Here is where the two engines are really needed. Climbing high above the beautiful valley, the train approaches one of the technical marvels of the railway. At the next station, Theolst, the engineers reconstructing the line in the 1950s faced a major problem. They could not use the original steam route to Festiniog because the Central Electricity Generating Board had built a reservoir for electrical generation on the original track. So the engineers had to construct the railway higher to bypass the reservoir. The original Festiniog railway line continued to the old Moylewind Tunnel. To gain height, the new line had to be built in an open spiral, unique in Britain, before continuing through a new tunnel higher up the mountainside. Here's the best view of the spiral. The first part is hidden in the trees, but once in the open, the line crosses over itself before swinging around behind this small hill. Emerging once more, the train completes its 360-degree turn. The root of the old track bed and many of the original timbers can still be seen beneath the new embankment. Now through Moylewind Tunnel, 
The train sweeps around the reservoir at Tani Grishia and arrives at the station of the same name. This reservoir has tamed and harnessed the power of the humble mountain stream through pumped hydroelectric generating stations. The designers of this station took great care to make the least environmental impact. Local stone was used and only one third of the building is visible above ground. At peak periods, this station is capable of sending 360 megawatts of electricity from four enormous turbines into the national electric grid in under 60 seconds. At full output, the water leaves the upper reservoir 233 yards higher up the mountain at a rate of 132 million gallons per hour. The station was dedicated in 1963 by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Visitors are welcome and guided tours are available seven days a week. But now, back to the rails. The final section of the railway runs between houses on the outskirts of Blyneye Festinio. Man-made mountains of slate waste, a reminder of the past, surround the town. Visitors can take buses from the center of town to the slate mines at Fleckwave, on the outskirts of Blyneye. Wales is known for its rugged beauty the independent spirit of its people, ancient Celtic heritage, and its slate mines. We hope you've enjoyed Heart of Freedom. I'm Bernie Coppell. Join me on the next Railway Adventures Across Europe. on the next World's Greatest Train Ride Video Adventure.